Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Good evening and welcome to Friday Night Prime, your weekly show every Friday 9pm with myself, Amr Suleiman, and my co-host brother Faisal Mahmood. Assalamu alaikum brother. Wa alaikum salam. Another good week. Awesome week. Another quick week. It just flies by, doesn't Always. it? Every week. This is becoming a catchphrase yeah, for yeah, the show. Yeah. I, think, I think if you look, listen to the past 10 shows, it's been like that. The same answer. The week's flown by. Yeah. It has been. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, that's good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, as usual, you, you can listen to us uh, on Salam Radio 106.2 FM. Uh, online at salamradio.co.uk and of course Facebook Live, YouTube Live, uh, our apps. So there's no excuse not to listen and tune in. Uh, a warm welcome as always to our Inspire FM listeners in Luton, 105.1. And Salam Radio, as usual, is on air for you 24-7, 365, uniting all communities. And we're all about creating unity and harmony within the Muslim and the wider community, delivering the positive message of true Islam and promoting peace and harmony inshallah so please also follow us on our uh, social media platforms facebook twitter instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel as well to get all the updates of all of our live shows and as usual we'd love you to get involved with the show today we've got a very interesting show lined up uh, you can whatsapp your questions or comments to us on 07745 278978 or you can give us a call here in the studio on 01733 602 133. Or you can even send us a Facebook Live message if you're watching and listening to us on Facebook Live. So we have got, as I said, a very interesting show lined up for you this week. And again, it's tying in with November being uh, Islamophobia Awareness Month. So we're uh, privileged to have with us this week uh, Dr. Zahid Pervez, Principal of the Markfield Institute of Higher Education. And we're going to be discussing in a few minutes the future of Muslims in the UK and the contribution Muslims have given to this country. So it will be an engaging and a very relevant discussion um, and we'd love your interaction. So once again those numbers 07745 278978 for your WhatsApp or 01733602133 and we're going to be back with you to start that conversation straight after this from Saif Adam. This is Praise. I will praise you in the morning to the sunset in the evening. I will praise you. I will praise you. When I'm drowning underwater in the deepest, darkest ocean, I will praise you. I will praise you. And I, ooh, I was born to praise you. And ooh, I was born to praise ya Bismillah, the Rahman, the Rahim Bismillah Our prophets walk on water I will praise you I will praise you In all of our misfortune Fall on you to rise above it I will praise you I will praise you And I ooh, I was born to praise you I was born to praise you And ooh, Allah for protection. 
You have my whole heart and affection We worship you and only you are perfection The Quran is what we tested on and life is the lesson Bismillah To the sunset in the evening, I will praise you. That was Saif Adam with Praise, one of my favourites, and a favourite we like to play here on uh, Friday Night Prime. Uh, welcome back, uh, Friday Night Prime, every Friday 9pm. And as I said to you just before that track, we're joined um, this week by um, Dr. Zaid Braves. I'll give you a quick introduction to, to Dr. Zaid. Um, he's been in education for the last 25 years, mashallah, and he started as a lecturer and a researcher, and then moved into higher education management and quality assurance. And he's currently, as I said, he's currently the principal of the Markfield Institute of Higher Education, which specializes in teaching higher education qualifications in Islam. Islamic studies and his research interests include governance, democracy, globalization and e-business and he has written a number of academic papers on e-democracy and problem solving from an Islamic perspective and he's also authored a book entitled Building a New Society an Islamic Approach to Social Change so we couldn't have any more, more relevant to discuss what we're going to discuss today and he's also been extensively engaged in community and charity work since his student life and currently he is a trustee of a, a number of charities. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Zahid, and welcome to Friday Night Prime. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much for hosting me here. Well, jazakallah khair for, for coming over on a Friday from uh, from Leicester, right? You drove up from Leicester. Yeah, I came from Mark, really. Yeah, yeah I'm from Markfield, mashallah. Um, so we've also got Brother Muzaffar joining us as well this week. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair for, for joining us. So we've got four of us all poised to have a heated conversation. <laughs> It'd be interesting. A healthy think. conversation. Yeah, yeah, healthy yeah. Uh, but I should warn our listeners, you may hear in the background some undertones of, of celebrations because we're at the Alamrek Bar Centre for those that don't know is where we're based and there is a, a Mendy event happening right outside this <laughs> studio so forgive us if you do hear any noise it should be okay inshallah but uh, we'll, we'll crack on so brother Zaid if I can start with you and um, get straight into this conversation um, you know some some argue that the Muslims live segregated lives and don't mix with other communities what is your experience and view on this very um, overpowering statement if I can share with you my own life yeah when yeah. we came here in the 60s um, we actually used to there was an English family who used to live with us okay um, they used to keep a dog as well right yeah so you know we understood the British culture uh, neighbors were very strong they mm. were extended families so we were mixing most of my friends were Sikhs and Hindus and Jamaicans and English yeah because at that time, Muslims, uh, and uh, the, they were very small communities. Hmm. And uh, so we were mixing, mixing with everyone, playing together, uh, shopping together, doing everything together, basically. Yeah, playing yeah. together and so on. Uh, later on, I think it was from the mid-70s when the um, you know, National Front became strong. Mm. In the 60s, we had the teddy boys and the skinheads and uh, so on. Yes. That's where people began to become more conscious. Oh, we are different or we are treated differently. Right. Before that, you know, that perception was not there. We were human beings mm. and we lived with everyone together. Yeah. So that's the time when people started to question and then started to reinforce their identities. And then mosques started and, and slowly, slowly. There were some Muslims in uh, cities where there were large concentrations. Mm. They did tend to segregate. Okay. But those Muslims who lived as minorities in a small population, they still have a very strong integration. Like in Wolverhampton, mm. there were only two, three thousand Muslims in the whole city. This was uh, back in the 70s? Yeah, no, no, even now. Oh, Pakistan, even? Uh, Pakistan is about 3,000. Okay. But recently, over the last five, six years, we've had Kurds and Iraqis and so on. So we have about six, 7,000 Muslims. Okay. But 25,000 Sikhs. Yeah. Jamaican community is very strong. Mm. So we are still very integrated with yes. the majority. Most of my neighbors are English. Mm. We live in an English majority street. 
So there has not been any problem. Yeah. But yes, I agree. There are some Muslims who live very segregated lives, mm. but not because they want to. It's because of the concentration of the community. I, I think okay. sometimes it's, it's a natural process as well, isn't it? So yeah. um, generally, um, you tend to hang around with people that have similar interests or maybe speak the same language or eat the same kind of food. Uh, is it a comf- is it a comfort comfort thing? zone? Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, I I remember having this conversation with my um, father about this. I think about a couple of years ago, mm. and I said it's interesting how uh, us families we lived close together in Pakistan, yeah. where our houses are, and it's similar here as well. Everyone's <laughs> like on the same street or the you know the same neighborhood. Yeah, and I think it's just a comfort zone, and it's easy as well. And and I think it's in our culture as well, where parents think, okay, I, I'd like to buy a house or something, or mm. help my child to move in near me because they want that family unit and I sure. think that's the kind of no no I totally like, agree yeah. if you look at the English who have moved to other parts of the world mm. you will also see them living you know segregated okay yeah so this is natural yes uh, people of the same sort of culture way of life they want to stick together mm. so that is natural uh, what I've read in sociology that it takes a migrant community 60 80 90 years to fully become integrated and, and immersed in society it's a natural process yes yeah uh, because generational things yeah there is a yeah. generation yes. thing yeah interesting yeah in terms of um i mean it's quite interesting what you said i mean could you give us some insight into how muslim communities have settled and adapted uh, to british society over the last five decades let's say yeah. if again if i can give you my own example so yeah. in the early 60s 70s um, we had to attend mother tongue classes <laughs> okay. because we could not speak the language. Yeah. yeah, and not only us but the Sikhs and others. We all were together. Mm. Slowly, slowly, you know, we we were also. I went to a church, a, a Sunday, a church school. Okay. I also used to attend a Sunday school, which was run by the church. Okay, we had to study the Bible, mm. celebrate Christmas, Easter. We had to sing hymns. I know my, many hymns by heart still yeah, now. I do as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So all these things were done, mm. and. Uh, um, s- slowly, slowly, you know, we, we we felt that we need to be educated. We need to move to a professional life. Mm. So, you know, that was the career path uh, through which we went. So Muslims, I feel they very quickly adapted themselves. Okay. We did have issues of halal food. Yeah. There were lack of mosques. Uh, there were all these things. But slowly they were able to provide mm. and develop these uh, services and facilities. So I feel Muslims have adapted and they are have made Britain as their home. And uh, the third generation, you know, they have no other place. This is their country. Yeah. And uh, they want to, you know, contribute positively towards society mm. and help out wherever they can. Yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I think that, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go on, carry no, on. I was going to say, I think that's often overlooked, isn't it? Yeah, the, uh, the, as you mentioned, the third generation. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of people out there, call it ignorance or, I don't know, prejudice. Um, they put us all in one bucket mm. and uh, you know th- there is this vast majority in my experience of the the, the current um, sort of I can say our age group we're not that dissimilar in age no, are we? similar, yeah. same similar, generation yeah. same generation yeah um, that uh, uh, like Dr. Zaid is saying you know they, they do want to contribute and they want to make the place their homeland this is effectively mm. their homeland uh, a better place to live and I think that is often overlooked yeah. wrongly and I think that's part of the problem yeah I mean I, I was going to say that you know, I'm third generation and my kids are fourth generation and they yeah. f- uh, for me I've still got that connection because I've, I speak the language and yeah. understand uh, our language and I, com- I can communicate quite easily sure. if I need to yeah. but generally in our household hmm. between me and my dad or m- me and my wife yeah. naturally we're speaking in English yeah. and my kids they can't speak our language and sometimes I do think that you know what it would yeah. be great if they have that some sort of connection with the culture. I'm with you. Do you know what I mean? For yeah. our heritage and understanding. Maybe it's as you get older, you kind of uh, think of those things. Mm. However, I always think that this is our home. Yes. And anything that we do in terms of voluntary work or community work, I always think of my kids and the following generation. If we don't plant those right seeds now, yeah. they will struggle. I uh, think so. And, 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 and just the, probably in the same way our forefathers did the same thing in terms of building mosques and hmm. those type of things. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, I think there's a huge cultural change taking place. Hmm. You know, we used to speak our own language at home, but yeah. now, like um, Faisal has said, hmm. 
we all speak english at home now with yeah. our children yeah. so this is a natural thing but also people are eating mcdonalds and uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> restaurants uh, before people used to just cook at home yeah yes. L- huge lifestyle changes yeah. tv was considered as haram yeah. now everybody is watching tv mm. listening to the radio they are the, the lifestyles have changed a lot over the years we're eating more junk food now yes yeah, more junk say. food yeah. i can certainly say that about yeah. myself mm. <laughs> but um uh, dr zaid as as a muslim how do you view yeah. british society yeah. today yeah. I mean, what is your see my interaction with muslims some of them have very negative views hmm. but very few okay majority i know my generation my f- father's generation came early they really are grateful to british society hmm. because britain welcomed them showed them hospitality okay. gave them the freedoms which they may not have had in uh, some other countries hmm. and also gave them the rights to participate ra- you know be heard raise their voice so they are grateful that uh, you know we are now here we we, we have freedom to f- uh, for our faith hmm. we can practice we have mosques everywhere yeah. we have madrasas we are free to practice our deen Mm. and to share this deen with other people so in that sense we are very very positive uh, uh, and we are grateful to society yes and there are many positives in our society uh, technological development is here we see infrastructure we mm. see huge amount of facilities and services like the national health gps yeah. all these things are there um also there is law and order you know there's a proper infrastructure and uh, you know access to justice mm. so these are many o- things which we sometimes overlook yeah so in that sense i am very sort of proud to be british and be living here that uh, i can practice my faith and i can share this faith however you know we have to be objective as well mm. and this is where i why i and other people who are trying to be active in society as well There are some negatives in our society as well. Of course. Over the last 5 five, de- five decades we have seen slowly from extended family to nuclear family to single parent family so there's a decline of fam- uh, family life. Yeah. children unwanted children are there mm. nobody to take care proper care of children mm. uh, elderly people there's all kinds of um, moral problems are arising in our society yeah. neighborhoods are declining so we f- see this as an opportunity as well being citizens of society we want to make sure britain is great as it was in the past mm. so we want to address some of these and we feel if we can revive that moral consciousness mm. and that will help to build relationships and strong families it would and that will uh, uh, develop social cohesion with that when people trust each other respect each other work with each other then there is a uh, energy for positive work together that, that make, begs me to ask two questions really one is um, what do you think is the main cause or causes of that moral decline and how as a community as a, as a cohesive society do we build that back up i mean these are difficult challenges we face right but what what's your opinions on on those again my analysis is you know that the root problem hmm. we can't blame any individual but uh, materialism has become deep rooted in society hmm. so material values we sometimes uh, um value profit maximization we value you know a- exploiting people just to make quick money yeah. so human dignity human respect is overlooked sometimes yeah okay. so employers exploit the employees mm. uh, businesses exploit their customers yeah in order to make m- money so we are driven by material Uh, bodily pleasures yeah so that has weakened our uh, okay. s- social fabric so materialism is when immediate gains immediate uh, short term you know life becomes the objective yes then uh, all these human relationships weaken yeah no that yeah, makes that, that makes sense yeah. um okay um you know there's that uh, sorry that's getting very loud now forgive us listeners for for that noise increasing there's not much we can do about that sadly um There's that that age old question which people often ask um about British values what are British values so if i can ask maybe brother Muzaffar and Dr Zaid your opinions on what are British values i'm i'm asking that question now because it's timely and relevant to what you were saying just now but um sorry we just had the door open there yeah sorry uh 
Anyway, back to the question. We got distracted there for a second. So, British values, in in your collective opinions, um, I don't mind who goes first. What, what do you what do you think they are? Do they exist? Yeah. What you know? Yeah. See, again, we cannot really pinpoint that these are British values. Hmm. Let me explain why. Like I said, over the last 50 years, I've seen a huge change in value. Relatives seem to be relative. Yeah. Values seem to be relative. Okay. Yeah. They change with time. Hmm. They change with context. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I am observing. There was a time when Britain had certain values of uh, f families were valued, relatives, neighborhoods were strong. Hmm. Yeah. Education was valued. Uh, respect for authority was valued. All these things. But s through time. I am beginning to see these values slowly change. Yes. And our values now, uh, we do say in public we value democracy, we mm. value all these things, but what is democracy? Yeah. 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 So in one country, we tend to support kingdomship. In another country, we tend to support dictatorship. Mm. And in another country, we say, no, we want democracy. Yes. So values are relative according to our interests. Right. And this is where the problems are. Yeah, yeah that makes so sense. we're not able to pinpoint what are real British values. No, and that is a challenge yeah, in itself. Yeah, actually, would you agree, Brother Mustafa? With, yeah, with the, yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting that uh, it reminds me of uh, an interview our current Prime Minister Theresa May did uh, on Five Live, I think. Okay. And she was a uh, Home Secretary at the time, and they asked her again and again. I think it was John Humphreys. Okay. Who asked yeah. her, "Can you define what British values are?" And she was she failed to do so. She couldn't. She couldn't. No. So I I, I feel I feel that human values, mm. you know, uh, rather than British values, we, we can have human values of honesty, trust, you know, mm. compassion, you know, kindness, as Brother Zaid mentioned, you know, yeah. love for the neighbor and so on. And these are, you know, human values and we can, we all share those. Uh, so as I, uh, I, I, I still don't know what, mm. what do we mean by British values? No, neither do I, which is why I asked the question. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping to be enlightened today. Yeah, I, th <coughs> I think um, really, so, uh, like Brother Muzaffar said, it is human values. And it, yeah. it, I was just thinking a uh, point my wife actually made a few, a uh, couple of weeks ago. Okay. And she, um, she volunteers at the, Sue Ryder yeah. old people's home and she was saying one of the old people there mm. they were saying how great it is in our culture mm. she said basically she said to her how great it is in your culture that you guys have that family unit you take care of your parents and yeah. she was kind of um, telling her about her situation about you know how um, uh, upset she was with her children right. that they haven't taken care of her they don't come to see her oh, there okay. and all those type of things yeah 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 um, and the thing is, it's it's not uh, like a uh, we can't you can't say it's just a British value or an Islamic value. These are human values. These are things that we should have hmm. uh, as from humans. our heart yeah. as human beings. And everyone okay. benefits. Yeah, exactly. So if we're yeah. all on that same page, if we all have those values. Yeah. you've got a cohesive society. That's right. Yeah, that's what it boils down to. Mm. So in terms of uh, slightly changing the topic here. Um, some say that Muslims, I mean, you hear this a lot on the news, some say that Muslims uh, want to impose Sharia law on society. Maybe there's some groups that want to do that, but, you know, can you explain to us uh, what is Islamic Sharia and what are your views on this? See, sometimes um, in order to sell news, we manufacture concepts. Mm. There's no concept of Sharia law. There no. is Sharia, yeah. but no concept of Sharia law. Mm. Because Sharia is not law only. No. Yeah. Sharia links morality with law and yes. they cannot be separated. Yeah. So Sharia, there is a concept, yeah. And Sharia is has a very wide and encompasses many, many things. Absolutely. So beliefs are part of Sharia, moral code is part of Sharia. Hmm. Yeah, a way of life is part of Sharia. Laws are also part of Sharia. Yeah. And all these things need to be looked at together. Hmm. So when uh, even if we assume that there is a Sharia law, Sharia law, Sharia itself has clear objectives. And I don't think any Muslim or non-Muslim will disagree hmm. that they don't want to achieve the objectives of the Sharia. No. So when we say we talk about Sharia, what we really mean is life must be protected. Property of people must be protected. Yeah. Lineage, every child has the right to know who their father is. Hmm. Yeah. Intellect must be pro uh, protected. Human dignity, honor must be protected. Yeah. This is, uh, these are the objectives of Sharia. Sure. Yeah. And uh, the, the capital punishment 
are a like um, deterrent mm. they are the last resort of course so sh- part of sharia means you create the conditions mm. so that these objectives can be achieved and as a last resort for example say we want to stop people from fornication as an example mm. you cannot go and lash people and stone them to death just because they've committed sharia says you have to create the conditions which yes. protects them from these things first of all yeah True. you have to uh, promote marriage you have to facilitate help young people to get married and so on uh, bring them up morally explain to them the dangers yeah. of all we'll, these things yeah we'll come back to this topic straight after the break um if you do want to get involved the number to call in 01733 Six zero two one three three, and we'll come straight back to the topic of Sharia right after this short break. Do stay with us. Stay tuned to Salam Radio after this short ad break. I've just come out of Penny Appeals Orphan Kind Orphans Accommodation. Brothers and sisters, they've got a kitchen where they're getting fresh food cooked and served to them. They've got foster mothers looking after them. These are orphans should be looked after. Sponsor an orphan for pennies a day. Call 03011111 or visit the website pennyappeal.org. Remember, small change, big difference. Ikra Academy is the only Muslim girls school in Cambridgeshire where your daughter will develop her knowledge of Islam and the national curriculum in a safe environment. Ofsted has judged the teaching and learning, leadership and management, pupil behavior and personal development as good in June 2017. Ikra Academy's qualified staff teach in small classes and the school is producing sports teams who have a track record of succeeding at national level with reduced fees and a good rating three times from Ofsted. Why not consider Ikra Academy for your daughter? Enroll now to avoid disappointment. Please contact 01733331433 or email admin at ikraacademy.org.uk. Do you have lots of clutter at home or in the office that needs to be kept but nowhere to keep it? Ivet Self Storage offers a secure, affordable, clean and dry home for your belongings. We have security systems in place which are monitored 24 hours a day ensuring that your items are safe. With a simple monthly payment, Ivet Self Storage provides secure and tailored facilities to meet your specific requirements, whether short or long term. We offer the best prices and longest opening hours in Peterborough. For more information, please call on 01733 06456 or visit us at Ivat Way Westwood. Don't miss the brilliant Pride of Pakistan at the Bull Hotel in Peterborough on the 25th of November at 6:30 p.m. sponsored by Salam Radio with Pakistan's favorite TV presenter and journalist Ikrar Ul Hasan and news anchor and journalist Wasim Badami in support of our Rohingya emergency appeal. Tickets are from £5. Book now. on 0161225025 or visit humanappeal.org.uk gems and jewels why sayings interesting events and moral lessons from islamic history a mother who spent wisely on her son A man came back to his home in Al Madina after many years of journey. He asked his wife about his son and an amount of 30,000 dinars which he had entrusted her before starting his journey. His wife said to him, "First go and pray in the mosque of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then I will tell you about them." He went to the Prophet's mosque and saw a gathering of many eminent attendees. And as soon as the crowd gave him space, he saw Rabi'a, his son there. Rabi'a had become a famous scholar and was heading a study circle at the mosque which included the likes of Malik, Hasan, Zaid, Ibn Ali, Al-Lahbi, Al-Musammi, and other figures of repute and intellect from Al Madinah the father confirmed the scholar's identity with a man from the gathering and then left the crowd to return to his home 
He said to This me, is Salam Radio, Peterborough's Muslim community radio. Broadcasting on 106.2 FM and online. Assalamu alaikum listeners, welcome back to Friday Night Prime. Uh, you're listening to Salam Radio 106.2 FM and you're also listening to some music in the background from the Alarm Rate Bal Centre but we haven't got any control over that so apologies to listeners who are getting somewhat distracted by that uh, noise in the background but hopefully you can still hear us loud and clear as we discuss uh, many issues uh, with Dr Zayed Pervez and Brother Muzaffar and, and Brother Fessel. Uh, Dr Zayed, you were saying before I had to cut you off, forgive me for the break, um, you were talking about um, uh, Sharia and the difference between Sharia and so-called Sharia law but uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, continuing on on that yeah. vein, please. So, so Sharia has uh, objectives, which I feel all human beings, mm-hmm. wherever they are, they will agree that yeah. we, for a good society, we need to achieve these objectives. Mm. Yeah. So this is where the laws come for each country, like protecting people's life, their property, honor, dignity, lineage, and so on. So Sharia is not just uh, these, but it's founded on moral values mm, mm. and faith. So before the laws can be implemented, you need to create the conditions, you need to have people with faith and moral values yeah. and all those things, and then the laws come. Right. Yeah. So sometimes we turn it upside down and we reduce Sharia just to a few do's and don'ts hmm. and a few laws. And this is where the misunderstanding is. Yeah. So we do not want to impose Sharia because you cannot impose it. It has to grow from within a society sure. and within a person. Interesting. So the whole concept of imposing Sharia law is wrong. Hmm. It's impossible to impose something. Absolutely. Yeah, because then they will be imposing a few laws, not the Sharia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you said that because you're, in effect, you're educating some, I would hope, some of our listeners who think yeah. the, the, the complete opposite. Yeah, in a very narrow way. In understand. a very narrow way. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have been some comments on Facebook from yeah. a regular listener, um, Ivan Humble. Um, uh, Aslam alaikum, Ivan. And uh, good evening. I hope you're well. Uh, so he's made a few comments. He said, um, going back to what we were talking about earlier on, he said, uh, no disrespect, but they need to speak English outside the home as well. Uh, that would stop some of the misconceptions out there. But um, Ivan, as you well know, you know people of our generation, uh, mine and my brother Fessel's generation, uh, they do speak. We do speak English outside of the home. That's the only language we do speak. So I hear what you're saying, and I understand that misconception can be born out of that uh, misconception. Um, and then you've also said that the main root problem is a lack of dialogue. I think that's also a valid that's, point. That's the key thing. That really. is a key thing. Yeah, I think language is part of it, but um, the main thing is the lack of uh, dialogue. Yes. Because um, I mean, I, I travel a lot around the UK. And especially in London, you see people from different backgrounds mm. and they're conversing in whatever language, Japanese or whatever it yeah. is. And they, these are sometimes professional business people. Yeah. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that personally. No. Um, however, I think if you're a resident in the country, mm. you should definitely make effort to learn the language uh, and make that part of your um, daily life, uh, to be honest. But yeah. I think uh, when it comes to language, as you said, and you said, Brother Faisal and yourself, you yeah. know, only speak English. Yeah. And our, you know, my, for example, my children, mm. they all speak English. There's for English, their first language. Yeah. So, you know, people who came from, you know, Pakistan or India or whatever, wherever they came from, naturally, you know, yeah, they were course. speaking that. That's natural. And as we said earlier, it takes, you know, up to, you know, as Dr. Zai said, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, decades or, yeah. you know, uh, to for the communities to, you know, fully integrate and mm. fully be part of their culture. But I so, don't think there's anything wrong, uh, personally. Wrong. I don't think there's, no, there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with um, maintaining your language. Yeah. I think that, that, to be honest, I wish my kids could do that. I wish I could do that. Yeah. I can speak broken Urdu, right, at best. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, my wife speaks Urdu, Punjabi, and etc. you name it. But um, my kids understand the language. So when their grandmother in Pakistan speaks to them in Urdu or Punjabi, they understand, but they just don't mm-hmm. have the confidence to respond. Mm-hmm. I think they could, but my eldest could, but, but the, the other two couldn't. So yeah. I wish they did. Frankly, yeah, I think one of the points I'm just looking at the comment uh, from Ivan is is uh, saying that it makes people paranoid, okay. and I think it could it could do because I remember I was working somewhere and mm. uh, one of my colleagues he's from a Polish background although he's born and bred here yeah um, he and he was speaking Polish with another uh, uh, person from mm. from an, uh, from the client company yeah. I was thinking, what they're talking about? Are they talking <laughs> yeah. about me, or you know, what? And so sometimes I can understand. I can yeah. understand where he's uh, where he's coming from uh, yes. with that, um, because especially with what's going on in the media, 
you know, and, and you hear about, you know, people using the words inshallah and uh, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, and people get paranoid on the planes and they, you know, yeah. people have been kicked off the, the yeah. planes on. For, for, for he makes, he, actually, Ivan makes a valid point now. Mm. Yeah, now you've mentioned that, and I've yeah. just seen his comment mm. um, about yeah. that. But I think uh, integration is a two way process. You yeah. can't just ask one community, you know, they're not integrating. You know, the other communities also need to, you know, that's a very good open their arms and, you know, welcome them in. Welcome them in, and yeah. yeah, that's how integration will happen. If you isolate a community, yeah. how do you expect them to integrate? But that's an you, excellent I, point. I think yeah. if you look at, it, um, uh, if you compare, for example, Britain to France, my sister lives in France. Oh, okay. And sometimes some of the things we can do very easily and openly here, and we're, hmm. you know, uh, kind of, I could say we've been accommodated hugely here compared to other countries yeah and i think it helps us as uh, citizens in terms of um, volunteering in terms of contributing back to the society whereas what you're finding with muslims there is this, they're getting even more isolated mm. so uh, people who would usually work in schools and things like that yeah they don't work anymore i mean uh, i remember um, she was saying something like uh, you know they've got these outfits now for Muslim women to go swimming. Yeah. Even they're not allowed in swimming pools in France. So no. these women who you might have considered moderate because they're doing this mm. activity, mm. they're not even doing that, mm. and it's isolating them further. So I think that two-way process yeah. has to exist in in terms of you know. Yeah. yeah if I can add, I s yeah. see these concepts which are constantly used by our politicians, by media, and so on. Yeah. And people then just pick up these concepts and reiterate them. Mm. What is integration? Integrate into what? You know, this is a yeah. question which yeah. we have to ask ourselves. If integration means having a common language, mm. no problem. If integration means that I become like somebody else, you know, then I have a problem with that. I want to keep my identity. I want to keep my faith. But I want a working relationship based on understanding, mutual respect, and we join hands for the common good. Then that is understandable. But the word integration, sometimes it means assimilation yeah, into okay. the main society. Yes. So which I feel is very dangerous because yeah. no individual can actually give up their own identity. We are all different. True. We all have different likes and dislikes. We all have different priorities and objectives. So each person should be allowed to pursue these, hmm. but in cooperation, in understanding, in peace, and working together for the common good, then that is understandable. I mean, the yeah. point you've just made, uh, we had a guest, I don't know if you remember, Father Toby. Yeah, of course. And he made a similar point. I can't remember if it was on air or off air. And he was saying it's important for us to hmm. uh, appreciate the fact that there is difference. You know, between, he was talking, we were talking about Christianity and Islam. He did say it on air. Yeah. I remember. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, we've got to respect that. Hmm. And in terms of, just pretending we're all the same mm. or like even between us i always say this there's differences we always of course we're always course. differing yeah. you know within muslims we're differing yeah and i think it's about having that understanding just like uh what dr zaid mm. mentioned and that's what we've got to kind of inculcate so that yeah. that takes me back to uh brother Mazafi. you were yeah. there on sunday when we had round yes. table discussions with um we, we welcomed um six or seven christian guests into the masjid yeah. And uh, that came up, that very point. So we were talking about the commonalities we had. Mm. But there was one individual from uh, one of the churches who joined who said we should actually be drilling down into our differences. Yeah. And I think he made a very, very valid point. Yeah. And inshallah, next time that we'll now be invited to their church and we'll have that discussion and talk, hopefully, about the differences rather than what we've got in common. Because mm. so I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think. Yeah, can I add one more thing? Of course. You know, those who are in business management, mm. one of the topics we have to reflect on is cross-cultural management. Yeah. Most international organizations now, multinationals, they're beginning to see the power mm. of people from different cultures coming together. Right. Because people from different cultures actually able to see a problem from different perspectives yes. and they are able yeah. to enrich the solution hmm. you know which we can develop so i think we should celebrate the differences rather than putting everybody into the same melting pot yes and uh, i feel we can enrich british society hmm. and we can collectively come up with much more creative solutions hmm. to many of our problems you know for just uh, as, a, as an example that uh, our society now tends to solve problems by applying technology technological approaches and material approach approaches economic approaches 
uh, to, to solving our problem. Yeah. What about spiritual approaches to solve social problems, mm. moral approaches? These never come into consideration. No. So people, you know, from different faith perspectives are able to bring these dimensions. Yeah. And uh, that will help us to look at things in a much more creative and broader ways. I agree. Well, actually, I attended a course. I think we ran it at the mosque. It was the mental health awareness type course. Okay. And uh, the pr- uh, the actual lady who was presenting that. Hmm. She mentioned that how faith uh, can be an instrumental part in helping people with mental health. Yeah. Uh, because of that spiritual guidance and it's something that kind of comforts them and something mm. to uh, to comfort yes. too. Yeah, um, it kind of helps them through that. Absolutely. So I think certain uh, departments it's in the health service they're yeah. realizing that, and that's uh, so that's why they've kind of employed you know chaplains Absolutely. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, we know Sister Dosif, right, who yeah. um, works as a Muslim chaplain in the hospital, and we hear from her. I've heard from her. Um, stories as as you've described, so I think it's uh, it's a it's a good thing, and I hope it can increase. Um, Doctor Zaid, if I can ask you a, another question, going back to to the media and their coining of certain phrases which have a detrimental effect on us. I mean, we hear the term uh, Islamization used in the media and and other places, but what does Islamization of society mean according to you? And should they use such terms? I mean, clearly they shouldn't. But what effect does it have on us as a as a faith yeah, group. Agree. You know, this concept like Sharia law mm. is very threatening because it's misunderstood. Yeah. Similarly, Islamization of society is another word where people become very frightened. Mm. So they, they understand that Muslims are going to Islamize which means they are going to impose, uh, uh, change our ways of life, change our clothes, force women to wear yeah. hijab and uh, force men to keep beards and mm. uh, and things like that. This is not what we mean by Islamization. No. So when we use uh, the word Islamization, Islamization means to improve human relations, bring peace between people, build social cohesion, strengthen family life, ensure fairness and justice for all people, mm. you know, fair wages for all, Ensure that policymakers don't just uh, consider the interest of the upper class and the powerful, but also give consideration the implication of these on the poor and the vulnerable in society and so on. So this is what we mean, how we can prevent harm to other people. Yeah. Mm. So ensure that uh, this social cohesion, this is what we mean by Islamization of society, bringing peace to every level and every area of society Yes. so that humans can you know work in a more harmonious way with each other that's what islamization is all about yeah 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 uh, there's another comment from from a sister she says aslam like and aslam thank you for listening sister uh, she says yes we are very comfortable here in the uk but do you think that there is a pretense of acceptance from mainstream british stroke english culture towards us than what the reality actually is uh, I am very positive. Mm. I feel we are going through problems at this stage. Okay. Far rights are on the increase. The media is not helping in the process much and the politician. And I believe that's all because of lack of understanding of Islam. Okay. As we engage with society more, as we show the power of the values, you know, which we want to practice. Mm. And as we start, it's start to solve big problems our society is facing. I really believe that the British public will begin to see Islam in a positive way. Inshallah. Yeah. So the weakness is on our side. We're mm. not engaging, we're not communicating, we're not in a dialogue. And that's what's reinforcing these uh, stereotypes and misunderstandings mm. and suspicion about Muslims. So a time will come as the British public becomes more educated. Oh, this is what Islam really is. I remember in a Guardian paper, hmm. Dr. Bari, Abdul Bari, who was from the MCB, yep. he wrote an article about what is Islam. Hmm. And one of the commentators who was against Islam, or he f- saw Islam as a threat, he commented that if this is what Islam is, what Dr. Bari has written, yep. he said, then I'll be the first to support it. Yeah. Okay. So as people become aware, then they become more positive about Islam. Hmm. So the weakness is on our side. And we also have to appeal to the media as well hmm. to become more res- responsible 
and to actually take time to understand what Islam is so that they can coin and explain it in the right way, in the right concepts. But do you genuinely think that will happen anytime soon? I mean, that's No, it will take time. Yeah. It will take time. It will be a struggle. Hmm. But uh, British and the Western world is going through huge moral, spiritual problems. Hmm. Hmm. They are looking for alternatives. They are open to different ideas and solutions. Yeah. Who will come forward and bring these ideas i feel you know the west uh, will take them positively i am very confident inshallah inshallah okay jazakallah her uh, the sister has commented again she said jazakallah her for answering uh, but we are uh, are we not being slightly naive by thinking uh, we are still going uh, to win a losing battle to convince others of islam others who have actually been studying islam for a very long time See, we can sit back and uh, just accept reality as it is and uh, have a defeatist mentality. Mm. And that's what many are doing. Yeah. Just there's nothing we can do. Things are going to get worse. Then what do we do? Mm. Where do we go? Mm. What will happen? Yeah. Or we can engage with reality and change it. So if you look at all the great prophets, all the great re- leaders and, uh, you know, uh, which we have seen in history, they saw reality reality you know basically was very dangerous situations hmm. they had the option either to pull back or to engage and change they went forward it was a big struggle but they were able to change uh, the, the reality yeah. so we are, have only been here 50 60 years maximum yes yeah it could take another 50 60 years 100 years it doesn't matter that's what life is all about <laughs> is to communicate, communicate, engage, have dialogue, mm. and live by Islam. Now look at the Muslims, they are not doing a big service to themselves. Mm. Very wrong images of Islam are being presented by some of them. Yeah. Yeah? They're not living by Islam, they don't understand Islam themselves. Mm. When non-Muslims look at us, you know, I can't blame them that they have a negative view of Islam. Mm. So we need to work amongst ourselves and we need to communicate. Yeah, I think a lot of it's uh, living by Islam is the, yeah. is the key thing. I mean, if, mm. if uh, in society, if business isn't done correctly, if, if, if you see on the headlines that Muslims are involved in these kind of drug deals or, you know, yeah. uh, financial fraud and those type of things, that doesn't send a positive message. No. Uh, no. And, and, and obviously those people aren't living by Islam. No. Um, but moving on from that, could you give us some examples um, where Muslims have pay- played a positive role? and contribute to our society. Yeah, again, if you look at even materially Mm. over the last five decades, uh, go to any hospital, go to any city, major part, you know, of the doctors are Pakistanis, Muslims. So in the medical profession, Muslims have played a very positive role uh, in transport, buses and taxis. (laughs) (laughs) Where would our society be without taxis and so on? That's true. Legal services, again, there are many professional Muslim lawyers, yeah? yeah? And they have also created hundreds and thousands of jobs Hmm. in small and medium-sized companies, yeah? Very true. Go to any main cities, hundreds of shops belong to the the, the new community. Hmm. And they have also, and this has helped in reducing unemployment and all those things and there are you know my uh, if you look at statistics there's a, over um, 100,000 this is what I've heard mm. Muslim millionaires mm. and they are investing in society creating yes. employment and so on and so forth so in addition to this you know they are also playing a, a role in charity mm. if you look at hundreds of charities now are run by muslims and the, many of these charities are focusing on british society they are going around helping the homeless people you know raising money for macmillan and uh, 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 cancer and research and all those things so they are contribute and they are say muslims are one of the main community which uh, leading community which is contributing financially as well yeah. supplementary education in building bridges locally into faith collaboration caring for the elderly there's so many youth organization they have mm. established providing youth services they're also joining mainstream political parties yes and playing a role so in every area you can think of mm. muslims are coming there are hundreds of muslim counselors there are many dozens of muslim mps now and lords as well Mm. but if you look at school governors you know in professional life muslims are coming forward it's not at the 
speed at which we want. No. Uh, I have been a lecturer for 25 years. Mm-hmm. I was at Wolverhampton University. Majority of my students mm. were from the mainstream. And I t- taught them be- t- so that they become great leaders for the future. Yeah. So, you know, all of my energies, abilities, I try to, you know, c- communicate to them mm. so that they develop into good people. So wherever you go, hundreds of teachers, where Muslims are contributing, mm. It is, um, you know, a pity that they are recognition. They are not being recognized for this. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, one or two people create some crimes, and yes. that's exaggerated. Right. But their positive work is not uh, recognized. No. And unfortunately, all the positive work, right? So we see the the the, the positive hordes of uh, Muslims coming forward in in the NHS and the yeah. politics and everything. But unfortunately, those that are prejudiced for whatever reason against Muslims see that as Islamization. Yeah. They see that as mm. oh, they're taking over. And that's a challenge that, I mean, I'm all for community cohesion and initiatives and doing what we can to break those barriers down. But I often struggle with thinking, how are we ever going to overcome that when you have ignorance? Yeah, I mean, that's that's double standard, isn't it? Because one minute we're saying, uh, yeah. they're saying we're not integrating enough. Exactly. The moment you start doing that and being yeah. active in society. They say we're taking over. We're taking over. Yeah. So I don't think you can win with those uh, type of people, I don't think you can. Honest with you. No. Um, in terms of um, uh, Islamic scholars, what role um, do you think they could play in terms of... Um, uh, uh, sorry, towards uh, decreasing Islamophobia in society. Yeah. You know, over the last five decades, many of our Muslim Islamic scholars, they have played a very traditional role mm. uh, as imams and community leaders. So they have focused their a- attention within the mosques and uh, preaching moral values and beliefs and making people, trying to make people good people and so on. It is only recently, because of the challenges which we are facing, that many scholars now feel that they need to now address issues outside the mosque. Yeah. And they are playing, a, in some places, a leading role in interfaith relations. Mm. They had, you know, this, uh, my visit my mosque days. Yeah. They're trying to invite people from all communities. Yeah. So they're trying to engage and engage more in charity work to help people, mm. you know, within our society. So they are doing a range of things in order to address Islamophobia and and the fear of Islam. But I'm also pleased to say that recently they are now looking at uh, our contemporary issues. Hmm. Some are now specializing in in Islamic banking and finance. Some are now specializing in sustainable development Mm -hmm. agenda. Some are now becoming in mainstream society as Muslim chaplains and and, and so on. And so all these areas in uh, in medical ethics, animal welfare, you know, they are trying to uh, trying to blend classical approaches to education with modern approaches so we can improve the pedagogy in schools. Yes. So they are playing a, a role in all these in laws, in policy analysis, in counseling, mm. for mental health. They are now beginning to uh, p- put their thought to these uh, everyday issues which we are facing. Yeah. Uh, sadly, Dr. Zaid, we're, yeah. we're fast approaching our time uh, is, is running out. Um, first of all, Jazakallah Khair on behalf of all of us here for your wonderful insights um, in, a, in a timely and relevant discussion. Sadly, it's timely. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we could talk for hours on this topic and and we've only really scratched the surface, unfortunately. So I think another show with you, is, I think, mm-hmm. is certainly need, great, need, think, needs yeah. to be had. Yeah, yeah. We, need, we need to go into more detail on this, yeah. but um, it's certainly been enlightening. And, and, and thank you for your insights and Brother Muzaffar as well. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a few minutes left to remind our listeners uh, about a couple of events which are taking place um, next weekend, actually. So first of all, uh, Salam Radio with Human Appeal are hosting um, Pride of Pakistan. This is part of a six city tour. Uh, this is taking place in Peterborough on the 25th of November, which is a Saturday, isn't it? Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a Saturday. So we have um, uh, famous celebrities from Pakistani TV. We have Ikra Ul Hassan, Wasim Badami, and hosted by Zahir Khan. This is in support of the Rohingya Emergency Appeal. Doors are opening at 6.30. The venue is the Bull Hotel. This will be an enlightening evening, a Q&A and information about people who've been on the ground in uh, Myanmar, you know, dealing with um, the, the horrific scenes that are happening there that we were all so familiar with. Uh, tickets are only £5, um, and the event is selling out very quickly. There are limited places. If you need a ticket, which I'm sure you will want one, you need to contact 07722 double five triple eight four that's zero double seven double two 
double five triple eight four. That's Pride of Pakistan, Salam Radio in conjunction with Human Appeal, the Bull Hotel, Saturday, 6.30. Please do get your tickets before they sell out. And also next weekend, uh, Sunday the 26th, uh, Dr. Zaid was just talking about mosque open days and Fazana Medina are opening their doors to the general public from 1.30 to 4.30. Do tell your friends, family, colleagues, neighbours uh, to attend. Nothing to book, just turn up. Uh, there'll be discussions, Q&A, books and leaflets to be given away. Um, food, of course, will be available. And there'll be an amazing exhibition as well, um, all about Islam. So that's for the in the mosque, uh, as, as we all know, is Gladstone Street. So please do inform your colleagues and neighbours to attend that. 1.30 to 4.30, Sunday the 26th of November. Uh, brothers, Jazakal ahead to all of you for, um, I think, a, a really interesting show and some great interaction from the listeners. Thank you all to those who commented and all those that are listening. Uh, do do stay tuned, please, to Salam Radio over the weekend. Uh, Salam Sports, our usual weekend show, will be on at 3 till 4 p.m. And there'll be um, some new live shows coming next week as well. So keep your ears peeled to Salam Radio. We're on air 24-7, 365. And there are some interesting shows. I think um, Sheikh Mahmoud is coming back with a show on That's Tuesday, right, yeah. uh, 11 to 12. Yeah. And uh, our very own Brother Muzaffar with Sheikh Nomani from Masjid Khadija will be doing um, a show. Brother Muzaffar, why don't you give us 10 seconds on what that show will be about? It will be on uh, understanding Quran, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Femal Quran. It will be discussion based. Uh, and and uh, Urdu show, I think. Urdu yeah. show, inshallah. Inshallah. So that's uh, uh, those and more shows. Uh, I think uh, Youth Inspired will be making a return soon as well. So plenty of reasons to stay tuned to Salam Radio. Jazakallah, as always, for listening and your comments. And inshallah, we'll be with you same time next week. Assalamualaikum. Yes, Welcome, Islam.